pandemic policies are shifting. Across the country, officials are relaxing COVID restrictions and protocols that have been in place since the spring of 2020. Most states have dropped their mask mandates. The CDC announced in February that masking indoors was no longer necessary. To many Americans, this all signals a shift that the U.S. is now on a path to pre-pandemic normalcy. But moving on from COVID concerns is a luxury people in the U.S. who are immunocompromised do not have. Seven million people who face higher risks from this virus. And they are watching closely as an Omicron subvariant has driven more and more cases over the last several weeks. Today, we meet an immunosuppressed physician who explains what navigating her life and her workplace is like in this COVID fatigued world. I'm Dan Gorenstein. This is Trade Offs. In 2019, Lindsay Ryan was practicing medicine, traveling the world, scaling mountains. I would pick a random country on my world mountains list to get the maps for the area and go. That December, Lindsay was in the Amhara region of northern Ethiopia climbing a 14,000-foot mountain. Two weeks later, she was back in the States laying in a hospital bed. I had gone from someone who was a triathlete to like barely able to walk to the corner store and buy milk and biscuits for my dog. Lindsay felt a constant burning nerve pain in her legs and feet. She was short of breath, and her heart felt like the tennis ball in a championship match during the Australian Open. Doctors diagnosed her with a rare neurological autoimmune disease. Her physicians put her on medications that kept her condition in check, but the treatment suppresses her immune system. Basically, the medicine makes it very difficult for her body to defend itself against infections and viruses like COVID. Overnight, Lindsay joined a rare club. An estimated 3% of the country's population who are immunocompromised. These are people that may have a genetic mutation or disease like HIV or take medications like Lindsay. There really is a lot of subtlety within immunosuppression. It is a huge spectrum from people who are profoundly at risk of death from COVID to people who are at maybe a little bit of increased risk or not really at all. Unfortunately for Lindsay, she is at risk of developing severe complications from COVID. In the immunocompromised club, she's a VIP. The pandemic ramped up while she was still learning to live with her condition. She remembers bunkering down with her dog, Juba, and knowing that even leaving her apartment was risky. A stray cough or sore throat sent her mind racing. You know, geez, this could be, you know, the last night before I end up back in the hospital super sick with COVID and on a ventilator. Um, this was before any effective treatments. So those days were certainly... And the pandemic continues to accelerate. Pretty anxiety provoking. In the past six weeks, the total number of cases has roughly doubled. So I'd have to say the numbers speak for themselves. And really lonely. No section of the country is safe from the coronavirus. By July 2020, eight months into Lindsay's diagnosis, doctors found a medication regimen that got her back on her feet. She was ready to return to work as an ER doc at the San Francisco VA. She knew that was risky. I got a notary and did my will. I did my health care power of attorney. Um, and I'm in my 30s and I still made sure all that was squared away because I didn't want to be caught off guard if something terrible happened. I think one of the advantages of medicine for me is that it trains you really well not to freak out. And so when I got in the space of actually being at work and I just, you know, you sink into your job of actually seeing patients, the, any, any freak out kind of dissipates and you just do the job in front of you. Fast forward two years. Circumstances have changed. Case counts are declining. Also, the science has changed. This comes as Democratic governors from 10 states now are lifting mask mandates to varying degrees. We know that vaccines protect very well against Omicron, which is the dominant variant. In spring of 2022, so many people are over business and school closures, social distancing and masking. They've got COVID fatigue. 
So the challenge for Lindsay is keeping herself safe while the people around her are more relaxed than ever. She's gotten four COVID shots, but like for many other immunocompromised people, the vaccines provide an unknown amount of protection. If you are on certain immunosuppressants, you're exposed to the vaccine, but your immune system responds kind of sluggishly. So then when you're exposed to COVID, to coronavirus, um, you really, your immune system really isn't very well prepared by the vaccine. It acts as if it's never seen coronavirus before. Many of Lindsay's colleagues at the hospital have swapped their N95s for surgical masks. That is not an option for her. The way I protect myself is really through meticulous use of protective equipment at work. So for me, my N95 mask is on from the time I enter the building until the time I leave. And if I need to have a drink of water or something or eat, it's you know in the ambulance bay outside sitting on a ledge. At work, Lindsay's colleagues often step in to care for patients who come to the ER with really high fevers or other signs of COVID. At home, that early pandemic isolation is still a big part of her life. This is a 38-year-old woman who yearns to get on a plane, climb more mountains, sit in a restaurant, and share a meal with friends. She doesn't want to think twice when the person standing behind her in the grocery store coughs. This experience has been both exhausting and sad. This was my third Christmas in a row by myself. The first because I was too sick and couldn't celebrate, and the second was kind of early on in the U.S. vaccination campaign. And then this year was Omicron. And so I spent, you know, I spent Christmas reading a novel, and I hope next Christmas won't be like that. Even as this relaxed moment poses a bigger threat to Lindsay's health, she is determined to find ways to make her isolation more livable. A good example, Lindsay packed up her Honda and drove to a state park near the Mexican border with her dog at the height of the Omicron surge. They camped out for a few nights. We saw a bobcat. We saw an owl. We went through all these dry canyon washes and because I was like, well, if I was going to make solitude feel chosen, where, where does solitude feel most chosen? And the middle of the desert in the winter felt like a pretty appropriate choice. So I've tried to figure out ways that I can make this time feel like I have a, a little bit more say over it. Like it's not all just happening to me. Lindsay has tried to reframe how she looks at her life. She thinks of a famous quote her friend told her about. The one about the difference between a monastery and a prison is all mindset. But no matter how she frames it, this is a difficult time. And conditions may be getting more dangerous for Lindsay and millions of others. A contagious subvariant of Omicron is now the most dominant strain of the virus in the world. In the U.S., it's responsible for more than half of new cases, and public health officials are bracing for another COVID wave. When we come back, the uncertainty of COVID funding and how that makes decision-making much harder for Lindsay and everyone else in the Immunocompromised Club. Welcome back. The U.S. government has spent nearly $4 trillion in its COVID response. Providing free testing, masks, vaccines, and treatments have been key to getting the country to where it is today. 75% of adult Americans fully vaccinated and hospitalizations down by 77%. Most Americans can remove their masks and move forward safely. That's President Biden during his State of the Union address in March. He told Congress the country needs to keep its foot on the gas if it wants to put COVID in the rearview mirror. Of course, continuing this costs money. So I'll not surprise you, I'll be back to see y'all. A few days after the speech, Biden asked lawmakers to approve $22.5 billion more. Part of that was to secure a treatment really valuable to immunocompromised people, the drug Evusheld, which can prevent COVID. But due in part to the size of the federal government's original purchase, and its distribution, some doctors and hospitals have had to ration it. Accessing the drug may not be as easy as you think. 
Meanwhile, UPMC is entering uh, eligible patients into a lottery system. The money would also be used to purchase treatments that can prevent someone who gets COVID from developing severe symptoms. Those have also been hard to come by. The White House warns it could be out of both these treatments by the end of the year without any more money. Knowing those drugs are easy to come by would make it a lot easier, Lindsay says, to take risks like meeting up with friends at a bar or spending Christmas with her family. So that's actually been something I've been watching really closely over the last couple weeks. It's one of the times when a political decision in D.C. has most directly affected my life. Congress blocked Biden's original ask, and while senators have reached a deal for about half of what the president wanted, as of April 6th, the bill is stalled over politics. Whether it's this battle over funding in Congress or relaxing masking mandates, this all sends a clear signal to Lindsay that there's a willingness to accept some collateral damage. But when you and the other 7 million people in the club are the potential collateral damage... It's frightening and, for Lindsay, unacceptable. There's this sense that the rest of America is moving on and is kind of blithe to people's plight. And also that America is willing to drop all these restrictions and you know declare this quasi-victory over the pandemic while not having done what's necessary to make immunocompromised people's lives more safe. Lindsay decided to write publicly as a way to advocate on behalf of the club she believes has been left out of the COVID conversation. Last year, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, published her essay about living in the pandemic without the protection of vaccines. Lindsay says the essay spawned a mini community, receiving about 100 emails across the country from others struggling with the nation's shifting pandemic attitude. They express a lot of pain a huge feeling of abandonment with this uncertainty about people's dreams, aspirations, plans, what their life will look like, can look like. I think for a lot of people, they've felt like their voices have just been muted and their lives are quite invisible. Lindsay says people wrote to tell her that her essay helped them feel more connected. But as long as this virus is around, immunocompromised people will live riskier lives than they did before. That's why, Lindsay says, Congress pushing through this latest round of funding, which would mandate $5 billion in spending on therapeutics, would help make the lives of everyone in her club a little bit safer. She'd also like to see employers make workplace accommodations for people vulnerable to the virus, like offering paid sick leave and improving ventilation. At this juncture in the pandemic, we shouldn't be asking the question, how do we go back to normal? We should be asking, like, what do we want our normal to look like as a society? Do we want it to look like it did pre-pandemic, where, you know, immunocompromised people, poor people, people of color all just die at higher rates of various diseases? Or do we want to think about what a better, more equitable society could look like? No one is sure what the next chapter of the pandemic holds, but Lindsay says if case rates and hospitalizations are low in San Francisco, she's made peace taking certain risks. Will I sometimes see people indoors? Yeah, I will. I'm, you know, like depending on the rates in the community, will I occasionally have someone over and I'll shove a swab up their nose as my hello? Uh, and then we'll, we'll then apologize profusely and we'll have dinner or whatever. Yeah, I'll do that sometimes. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have no social life, um, but I have a, certainly a more muted social life than I used to. Lindsay hopes one day the pandemic will be an afterthought, but until then, she'll keep her N95 mask handy, a watchful eye on community spread and lawmakers in DC. I'm Dan Gorenstein. This is Tradeoffs. The last 10 months have been a roller coaster for Alzheimer's patients and advocates. Last June, they rejoiced when the FDA approved the first new treatment in nearly 20 years, Adahelm. 
but in January, Medicare proposed only paying for the drug for a tiny fraction of those suffering from Alzheimer's. Now, Medicare is poised to make its final call on how many will be able to access this controversial and costly drug. We'll break down Medicare's decision and how this process may change U.S. drug policy next time on Tradeoffs. Thanks for listening to Tradeoffs. If you've just discovered us, remember to subscribe to the feed so you never miss an episode. Subscribing is free and easy on whichever podcasting app you use, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. The Tradeoffs team is producers Andrea Perdomo and Ryan Levy, Executive Director Jessica Silverman, Communications Manager Nora Tahiri, Senior Health Policy Editor Sarah Thomas, Sound Designer Andrew Perella, Executive Editor Dan Gorenstein, and Senior Producer Leslie Walker. The Tradeoffs theme song was composed by Ty Sitterman with additional music this episode from Epidemic Sound and Blue Dot Sessions. Additional thanks to Emily Landon, Nathan S. Truger, Dipti Barot, Jennifer Schlemmen, and Eric Gasho. Thanks also to all our listeners who helped to support our work, including Abigail Joseph, Dennis Bronstein, and Stacy Dusitsina. Tradeoffs is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Arnold Ventures, West Health, the Better Care Playbook, the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, the Sozose Foundation, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. The views expressed in this episode are those of the individuals and not those of Tradeoffs staff, advisors, or funders. <laughs>